Will you join me in today's reading, Leviticus 19, 1 through 2, 9 through 18? The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the bare edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf, deaf or put a summoning block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall not render any unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not... Take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. There's a lot of rules. Thus far in our worship series, Spiritual Affective Disorder, we've reflected upon what we might do in our everyday living to improve our spiritual lives. We began in early January by agreeing to make the conscious decision to flip the switch or to really take each day as a gift from God. How are we doing on that one? The second week we talked about adjusting our playlist both literally and figuratively playing music that lifts us up instead of tears us down, and then figuratively turning down those voices in our head, that those old record players that continue to tell us who they think we are and focus on our failures and disappointments and our limits instead of celebrating who we are and looking into all the possibilities God might have. So how about that one? How are we doing on that one? Then we followed with, with some weeks. We, we had an incredible sermon by our associate pastor, Kenny Bishop, talking to us about lightening up a little bit and laughing at ourselves. That was a great sermon, wasn't it? And then we followed in some weeks talking about doing random acts of kindness in our everyday life just because, not for recognition or fanfare. We agreed that altars are found everywhere, not just in church. And we were challenged to find altars in our home and spend some time there in prayer, discerning God's will for us. And that, last week we talked about the gift of walking and how sometimes our faith calls us to walk in a march loudly. And sometimes we're called to walk meditatively along a beach shore or in the mountains or a hike in our neighborhood. And even for those with limitations on their ability to walk, we're reminded of the gift that it is to be able to walk, aren't we? And we're reminded that even when we can't walk, we can still go to places in our mind which remind us of God's presence. So how are we doing about laughing a little more? Making someone's day? Spending more time in prayer? Or walking with intentionality? You see, these are everyday practices that really, really change our perspectives and can elevate our spiritual journey. But for those of us who may have gotten a bit off track, let's just own that and regroup a little this morning. Today we continue talking about everyday things we do, and, and this one's big. For this morning we're talking about food. 
But first, a little background on our scripture reading. It comes from Leviticus. And lots of folks, especially those who identify as gay, when we hear Leviticus, we often shut down or take off running to the nearest door. <laughs> That's because the holiness code of Leviticus has been misinterpreted. Let me say that again, misinterpreted Amen. to condemn homosexuality. It's safe to say that this abuse of this particular scripture, this Bible, this book in the Bible has resulted in many, many folks staying away from the church. And that's another sermon, but it's incredibly sad to me. And that said, even when I hear Leviticus mentioned, a part of me thinks, oh wow, here we go. <laughs> Yet when we put scripture that we hold sacred in historical context, we can leave with valuable lessons. And Leviticus is no different. Leviticus forms the center of the Torah. And the Torah is the foundation of Jewish teaching. And it's worth reminding us again, my friends, that Jesus was born and died a Jew. He was not a Christian. I still shake my head at Christians who deny room at the table for their Jewish brothers and sisters when in fact... The Jewish community is our history. It's our foundation. Again, that's a sermon for another day. <laughs> the book of Leviticus focuses on the presence of God in the midst of community. Did you hear all those rules? Don't slander each other. Don't bear false witness. Don't steal. Don't charge interest for loans you make to folks in the, in the community. These were rules for this ancient community. And it gives great attention, bless you, to what is considered holy for the priest and for the community at large. And because the ancient priests were Levites from the tribe of Levi, they decided to name this book of the Bible Leviticus. Leviticus gives instructions to the life and practices of all Israelites. What is clean and what is not clean. Dietary regulations. Oh, when folks are beating you over the head with Leviticus, they ignore that they eat shrimp. <laughs> it talks about ethics. It does talk about sexual relations and, and how folks are called to live in community. Taken literally, which is what some claim to do, it's a pretty disturbing picture Leviticus is. Bless you. <laughs> Got lots of colds in here today. So really, if you, if you look at Leviticus and you take it literally as folks claim to do, it, it's sort of crazy. But don't take my word for it. Go home and read chapters 17 to 26. For taking literally, well, we just all have to sit under a tree and be still. Perhaps that's what initiated the Buddhist religion. It seemed like so many things were against the holy law. You just go sit under a tree and pray about it. So what do we do with Leviticus? Well, I hope we do what I challenge us to do with every part of Scripture. We put it in context. Recognizing first that it was not written to us. It was not written for our contemporary society. It was written specifically to a group of people at a specific time in history. Now that doesn't mean that, that we can't learn and grow spiritually from these words, from these incredible stories in the Bible. Quite the opposite. There's lots we can learn. The simple lesson from our reading today appears to be about what we eat. And in those days, the ancient community only ate what they grew and harvested. There was no Kroger checklist <laughs> where they could choose what they wanted from the store, do an online order, and then someone else shopped for them and loaded it in their car at a scheduled pickup time. And I hate that for my Israelite brothers and sisters <laughs> because I am a big fan of Kroger checklist. In fact, as we are here this morning, someone's shopping for Brenda and I. I'll pick it up at 1 o'clock. For busy people 
it is a game changer. Stanley tells me 40% maybe of Kroger business now is Kroger click list. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Stanley, tell your folks that that plug I'm giving, I need, they need to donate to the church, okay? <laughs> You know, but the anxious community had it pretty hard. They had it pretty hard. I guess a lot like folks who grew up like my mom. Mom's family was poor. Now she tells me they didn't know how poor they were because everybody around them was poor. But they ate and they only ate what they harvested and grew, what they could can then having freezer, then having refrigerator, no running water, no electricity. Isn't that crazy to think about that? God knew when to let me be born. <laughs> but you know, they could only eat what they harvested and grew, and whether that be fields or chicken or pigs, there was no car to drive to a store. There wasn't a store that had pre-processed meat or eggs or vegetables. Gardening and preparing meat was part of their daily existence. So, you know, if you grew up like that, maybe this scripture really speaks to you a little more clearly. But I hope it will speak to others of us who can use click list. For what this scripture tells us is that when we harvest, in whatever way we harvest... Be it grow it, make it, can it, drive to the store and have it put in our cars. We're not to keep everything for ourselves. Listen again. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. Hmm. Don't you wish folks in power would read those sentences a time or two? Amen. We might garden these days, and even if we do, it's my guess it's not because it's our only option to eat. But we're reminded that God's instruction to the ancient community was to share. And not to share from their excess because in truth there was never enough food back then. God gives them the commandment to share from their very life existence. Share to the poor and the alien. Now pay attention here church because the devil's in the details or I would say God's in the details. Because the sentence could have stopped at poor. And then we could support the politics or ideology of Let's take care of our own. But God didn't stop there. That's right. And neither should we. Amen. The sentence concludes, leave them for the poor and the alien. And for us, that means the immigrant legal or not, Amen. the refugee, right. the stranger, yes. the person different from us. Amen. See, we can learn from these instructions, church. We can learn what God intends for a harmonious, equal, and loving community. Share and share again, not from our excess, but from our very core of life. That's right. I love to go out to eat. We don't do it very much since we've been trying to both watch our budget and watch what we eat. And it's tough to watch calories and eat out. And it's even tougher, especially for me, to resist the dessert menu. Amen. Now those of you who know me well know that in the past when I'd go out to eat, I'd ask for the dessert menu first, just so I could plan what I was going to have after I ate. Amen. And the server didn't have to say, now leave room for dessert. It didn't matter how full I was. I was having dessert. Every time. I love sweets. I blame it on my mom because she had homemade sweets every night of our life growing up. 
I blame a lot on her that she's really not responsible for. <laughs> but there's a certain splurge, isn't there, in having dessert out? You know, they bring it. It just looks better than when you have it at home. All decorated, got the fudge on the plate, little smiley face. It's great. It's a splurge. In our scripture, if we pay attention to the details, God wants us to share our splurge. Did you gloss over that? Listen again. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes from your vineyard. What'd they use grapes to make? Wine. Now wine in the ancient community, it's not like we think of wine. Wine in the ancient community was reserved for the political powers. A reserve for just certain folks who could go to the temple after they made the proper sacrifices. So it was used as power and privilege. That's the metaphor for us. So God is preparing us for the gospel of inclusion that Jesus would later come to model for us. Not just welcoming the poor and the immigrant and the refugee and the stranger but including them in our lives in every way and leaving some grapes for them too. This morning we're called to be mindful of how we eat, how we live, of what we might waste or allow to spoil, be it food or our life. We're called to share the basic necessities and the splurges of our living, to share the wheat and the wine, we're called to take another look at the menu. Instead of determining what we have to have to top off our life, we're called to remember those who don't have a meal That's right. or a friend yes. or a church Amen. or an advocate. Yeah. And then we're called to do something about it. Amen. At Bluegrass, we do an incredible job of sharing food resources. I'm so proud in many ways to be your pastor. And that's one of them. From backpacks to random collections for organizations to our now weekly NOSH program, we're very intentional about sharing food. And as we embrace that success, and it's okay to embrace that, we might move to reflect on our own spiritual practice of eating and living, giving thanks for what we have, and asking ourselves, how can we share? Who is without? Who needs us? And perhaps most importantly, challenging and changing systemic issues of hunger and equality. We can march all we want, but until we change the systems of injustice and inequality, of hunger and poverty, march is all we'll do. God's message to the Israelites was this. Don't get too full. Don't eat it all. Don't get too full of yourselves. Another look at the menu of what we have, of what we need, of who we are, and what we can share. I say to the God I serve, and let me have that dessert menu. Let me take a second look. No, I'm good. I'm not quite full. But thanks be to God, I don't need to get too full of myself.